everyone. This is April Cox. We have a special guest speaker with us today, Nicole Lavoie, and we're going to be talking about why you need a graphic designer. Nicole Lavoie and I have known each other for a very long time. We both live in Rhode Island, and I met her at CVS Health where we worked. She is an amazing graphic designer. For those of you who are looking for a graphic designer, she is a fantastic option. She is phenomenal, and I'm a big fan of Nicole and her talent. Um, like April said, I've known April for, oh my gosh, it's going to be over 10 years now. So I started in graphic design. My career path kind of took me towards project management, and then recently just started getting back into graphic design. And I've been trying to specialize in book layout and design, just because I'm finding there's a lot of need for that. But I also have experience in lots of other areas of graphic design and that type of stuff. So I do additional work beyond this also, but we're going to focus on the book side of it today. So what I want to talk about is just kind of what a graphic designer does, because I know you all talk about and look for illustrators to do the artwork. So then a lot of people don't really understand where graphic designer comes into play. So I'm going to talk a little bit about in general what graphic designers do, but then obviously more of it specifically to what I do and everyone works differently. So it's going to be a little more specific to what I do, why you need a designer and when you should engage a designer. What I do in regards to the children's books that I do is I do the book layout and design. So when you start looking at typography, which is, you know, how the text is formatted on the page, there's a lot of things to be considered beyond just you know, copying that text from Word and, and dropping it on top of the illustrations. You want to think about the audience you're going to be, that you're targeting, you know. So when you think about, like, if you're talking preschoolers, early readers, you got to think about how they're learning to write, how they're learning to read. So if you look at the type on my page here, my presentation, if you look, the A's don't have the hook on top of it. So, you know, the A's with the hook or things with the extra, you know, little uh, Saracen stuff, they tend to cause some issues with younger children and not being able to identify that. So there's a lot of little pieces to the whole choosing the font. So you want something that's going to match the style of the illustrations. You want something that's going to kind of give that same feel of what the story is about. And then obviously it's about putting the text somewhere on the page where it's not taking away from the art, but also flowing with it. So you know, there's a lot to the typography aspect of it. And then also I do a lot with the covers, the cover design. So, you know, you have a great illustration for the cover, but you need to look at how the title's on there, what the colors look like, how it's going to look when it's sitting on a shelf in a bookstore versus when it's sitting in a big long list on an Amazon, you know, search page. So there's all different aspects of that. And then obviously the biggest part of it is the requirements to build the files. So all Publishers require slightly different files. So you have traditional printers who are, you know, like April's talked about signature printing. You have the different printers that are overseas. Then you have a paperback versus a hardcover. You have Ingram Spark versus Amazon. You have a Kindle ebook versus a PDF ebook that you just email out. And they all have different requirements as far as how they're created, how they're sent, and all that type of stuff. So there's a lot more to it than just formatting. So one of the things I provide my clients is a book template. And this really shows where the book is going to be trimmed. So the trim is the finished size of your book. So if you're looking at an eight and a half by eight and a half book, your trim size is eight and a half by eight and a half. But if you have artwork going all the way to the edge, you need to have a bleed on there. And the printers actually print it on larger paper and cut it down. So your files and your artwork has to be set up to include that bleed, which is usually, you know, an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch. Then there's the also areas that are a margin safety or gutter. So your margin safety area is everything outside of this dotted line that I'm kind of highlighting over. And what that is, is, you know, places like Amazon and big printers, they do a batch run, they cut it, it all base, it's all dependent on how that paper is lined up in their cutter when they cut it. So the safety or margin area is, it's kind of like it's fair game when it comes to trimming. Obviously you're hoping they're not going to be off by a half an inch, but you have to take that into consideration. You don't want a critical part of your illustration or text from your story 
to be outside that margin safety area in case the, the trimming or the cutting really is off a little bit. And then the center area, it's margin, it's a safety here, but it's also called the gutter. So the center area is called the gutter and that's where your binding is. So when that center is folded in half or glued at the binding, you know, it's not gonna open all the way. It's not gonna be, you're not gonna see all the way to that edge because it's gonna be in the binding. So I create these or I have these for all the standard book sizes and I provide them to the illustrators that aren't as familiar with the process or don't already have templates set up because this shows them exactly where the live area is, where the critical detail needs to be, and then where the background and those extra elements need to go off the page so that, you know, when it's trimmed, you have a full, full color page. Some illustrators don't need anything. They've been doing this a long time. They know the process. They've got it down pat. Others, you know, they need that basic template. And some request or require kind of like a storyboard where the text is gonna be on the pages, you know, how it's gonna be broken apart. This is actually samples from Misty's book. We started by choosing the font and I just put the blocks on each page. So that way the illustrator can kind of visualize how much space that's gonna take up. And then once they started doing the sketches that you'll see in the second one, then we determined where it was really gonna fit based on, you know, the space where there wasn't anything too busy. So now you see in this third shot where the text is showing up. So because the illustrator we made this really dark, we went with a white text on top of it. Whereas if it was a lighter background, like some of the other pages have like a light blue sky, we use black text on it. So it's kind of like a multi, multi-phase process. You know, we start with the font, seeing how much space it's gonna take up. Then the illustrator starts with some, some rough sketches and their character development and that type of stuff. And that's where I can actually drop them in. So with Misty's book, it's actually watercolor. It's traditional watercolor. So these are actually photos of hand-drawn sketches. So they're not exactly to proportion just because of the angle of the photo. But normally, like if a illustrator is working digitally, it would fill that whole template because they're working right at the exact size. So then why you need a designer, you hire an illustrator who has a style you like and who knows what they're doing and you know creates the art beautiful. You hire an editor that you trust who's gonna edit it properly. If you wanna be successful, you want professionals doing all of the different pieces of the puzzle. You know, there's a lot to it. When you're looking at the color of the fonts to use, you know, certain colors relay certain emotions and there's certain colors that are complementary to each other. So I kind of put a color wheel here, you know, and normally if you look at the color opposite it on a color wheel, those are complementary colors. So like you've got reds here, blue is complementary to it, purple, or they're calling it mauve here, and a yellow green. So, you know, there's aspects of the color. Then there's also alignment. You want to kind of have some consistency between your pages, between the content on the pages, so that everything looks the same. And then you want to look at placement. There, you know, there's a lot of things going on with some of the pages as far as different text. Sometimes you've got text that's in a larger font that's kind of looks like someone speaking. So that has to be in a place that makes sense to the illustration. One thing Misty and I looked a lot at is the way you naturally read. So you, you read left to right and then you go down and then left to right again. So it makes kind of like a, a visual Z. So that's why, you know, we start here with the title and then we go down to the author names and then we end with the series logo. And that's kind of a consistent flow with a lot of the pages. So when we're working on the inside pages, we're trying to look at what the art is portraying and where the verbiage is that goes with it to keep them together. So another thing you want to think about when you're doing the cover is a lot of times the illustrator will do some beautiful art. They'll leave space for the title or I'll work with them to create the space for the title. But you want to make sure that the title's not on top of really busy artwork. So there's an aspect of that that not all illustrators do the cover or do the typography part. They'll say, okay, what are you thinking for the cover? Are you gonna use an existing illustration? Do you need a separate illustration? And I love this photo. I put this here. So this is Saren Patel and he's actually, I believe he's 10 years old. I helped him create a comic book. It's all his drawings, all his writing. I colored his art here for the cover and it's just amazing how well, if you look at the racks here behind him of a store that started carrying his book in India and how much his book stands out because of that bright red, bold 
title right there. When you look at all these other ones, that one really pops. And that's something you have to think about is where it's going to be displayed. You want to make sure, like in this case, the rack sometimes will cover the lower half of a book. So what do you want to have in that top half? What do you want to be visible, the first thing people see? Another thing that April and I have talked a lot about is what it looks like on Amazon. I mean, it's kind of the nature of the beast nowadays that you're going to be on Amazon, whether you're doing print on demand or whether you're ordering hardcover copies and selling those through Amazon, odds are pretty good that you're going to be on Amazon to some degree. So what does it look like when it's a little thumbnail? So I put a couple of April's books here. You know, we worked hard when we redid her coloring books to make sure it was obvious that, you know, this is a coloring book, this is a coloring book and that they all kind of complement each other. And then I did this cover for a friend and she wanted the purple. She wanted the purple to show up. So, you know, we went with really bold colors. We chose a font that normally I wouldn't lean towards for a children's book because it doesn't just grab you as far as being able to be big and bold and easy to read, but it's not a kid's book, it's a novel. So it fits it more. You can see Saren's book here, the title really stands out. And then this is Misty's and we started with this book because we really loved the outdoor scene, but the cover was really just getting too dark. So then we tried it, one of the pieces of art that has an indoor scene. And we're like, okay, that's bright, that's colorful, that's, that's getting closer where we want. And now this is more of where we're landing. So you've got bright and colorful, you can still read the title at that size. You know, the rainbow shows that it's a cheery book because it's a when you feel better book. So there's different aspects to that cover and that piece of art that you, know, you need to consider beyond just it having a beautiful illustration on it. So some illustrators still design in RGB and that is red, green, blue. And I kind of put a little sample here. That's what you see digitally. That's what you see on your computer screen. That's what you see on your tablets. That's like infinite number of colors. You know, our screens can produce any bright fluorescent color that we want. A printer traditionally uses CMYK. So it's, they use those four inks, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black to create and actually print your book. So that's what Amazon uses. That's what someplace like Signature uses. It has a wide array of colors that when you mix those colors you can get, but you're not gonna get those really bright, bright fluorescent colors. So it's really important when working with the illustrators that they're either working in CMYK or when they're done or getting close to finalizing that they're doing that conversion because a lot of times authors are approving artwork that's in RGB and it looks great on screen and then they get their sample from Amazon, their proof, and it looks nothing like it. So Amazon will allow you to upload a PDF for your files that's RGB, but they're gonna convert it. So what I like to do is I like to work with the CMYK images from the get-go because that's a true representation of what your book is gonna look like when you get that proof for that hard copy in your hand. So I think that's just something to call out. I've had some clients that I had to kick back to the illustrator because I wanted the illustrator to make the color adjustments. I'm capable of doing it, but I want them to finalize what their art looks like. You know, when you make that conversion, you're gonna lose colors. Some stuff's gonna get darker. You know, I want the illustrator to do that, those final color corrections, because I want them to be happy with what it finally looks like. So I usually try to get on top of that right from the get-go to make sure that that's being done up front so that you know what you're gonna expect as a printed piece and the illustrator is happy with the final output. This is just a section of the detailed requirements from Amazon for a print-on-demand cover. This is just the specifications for a cover. That doesn't go into the inside pages, it doesn't go into a Kindle book. So there's a lot of different information here and they'll give you a, a template for their cover. I just kind of put a sample here. This is a magazine I do that uses that template. But my position is if this all looks foreign to you, that's why you want someone who's really familiar with it to be doing it. And what I try to do is Ingram Spark has a little bit more, I guess, tighter requirements, you know, they want a little more space around everything. So with my authors, whether they know they're gonna go to Ingram Sparks or not, 
I work with Ingram Spark requirements primarily. And then that way, if you ever choose to go to a traditional printer or Ingram Spark, the files are already created in a way that they can be used for all of those different channels with very minimal changes. My goal with my files is I, as April knows, I create different layers instead of having a duplicate of everything for a paper book, a Kindle, a hardcover. If they're all very close, I put them all in one and that way I can kind of turn on or off the elements that I need or don't need based on the book and um, you know, try to keep it as straightforward as possible. Because as you make edits along the way, if you have to, you don't want to have to go back to five files and make sure you've gotten them all. So I try to build to meet, you know, the standard, the core of what everyone's going to end up looking for. So when to engage. So I have clients that I have been talking to that are still writing. You know, they just wanted, wanted to check in, see when's a good time to start corresponding. And then I have clients who already have their art done. They already have their text ready. They just need it put in InDesign to have it laid out. So my recommendation normally is to try to pull me in or pull a book designer in as soon as you have that final edited manuscript, because that's when you can start putting it on those templates and see how much space it's going to take up. Because the sooner you can give that information to the illustrator so that they can accommodate that, the better, because you don't want to have to end up having to go back to Illustrator and say, okay, you got to move this part of it over a half an inch, the text doesn't fit. Or you don't want to have to sacrifice the size of the text or put extra line breaks in when it doesn't flow right by doing that. So my position is usually the sooner the better. I like to say that the manuscript should be almost done or completely done because once you start changing words or sentences, it can impact how much space it's taking up on the page. And then that could impact what the illustrator is doing. So if you had, you know, a sentence that had 10 words in it, and now all of a sudden it has 15, that's going to require more space. So you need the illustrator to make sure they're leaving enough space for that extra text on the page, if that makes sense. And obviously a big thing that you want to have figured out very early on in the process is the size of your book. Because obviously if you're going to do an eight by 10, and then you decide you're going to do an eight and a half by an eight and a half, that's a completely different proportion. You know, you're going to lose top part of your illustration. So you want your illustrator to be designing to the right size and the right proportion. I have a client who wants to start with an Amazon paperback of like an eight and a half by an eight and a half book. But at some point when they have the funds, they're looking to do maybe like a 10 by 10 hardcover. So I told her, I said, have your illustrator create that artwork at the 10 by 10 size, because we can scale it down. It's still a square, so it's not going to impact proportions. So I said, have your illustrator do it at the larger size. That way we have that higher quality. It'll be good to go at a larger size whenever in the future she's ready to do that. Usually if you go eight and a half up to a 10, you're not going to lose, you know, the quality is still okay. But obviously if you know from the get go, might as well make it bigger and start that way from the very beginning. I do have one other thing, yeah. Nicole. I know that when we're delivering files to Amazon, there is a delivery charge, you know, like when somebody downloads your Kindle. Yes. And so can you speak about formatting of the book in a way that helps reduce the size for your Kindle? You're not spending a lot of money on delivering the files, which right. eat into your profits. Yeah, so I work in all Adobe products. So I work in Adobe Photoshop for any type of photo editing. I work in Adobe Illustrator for any type of vector art editing or creation. And then I work in InDesign for all of my book layouts. When you see these templates, so when you're doing a paperback, you need that extra bleed because it's gonna print on larger paper, it needs to be cut down. But when you are doing an ebook for the Kindle, you don't need that extra. You don't need as high quality. But when I have it set up in InDesign, it's all a matter of how I export it. So, you know, when I'm doing something for the Kindle paperback, I export it at the highest resolution for a print resolution. I export it at CMYK. I have it include that extra bleed. You know, so it's a really large file, and that's what they need for printing. When we're doing the ebook, I use the exact same file and I export it without the bleeds on it. 
I export it at a lower resolution, usually around like 120 DPI, because that kind of covers, you know, your larger tablets and stuff. I've experimented with going a little lower, and I don't think that the file size you save really makes that large a difference versus some of the quality you might compromise on, you know, larger devices with larger screens. But yeah, like April said, Amazon charges you, I think it's like per megabyte or something of how they download. So, you know, the more when I'm working in InDesign, I can export it. It automatically reduces the size of the images. It, ex it reduces the size of the file. So by doing it all in here, I have full control and I'm not using separate files. I'm not doing anything different. It's just all compressing it and reducing it right when I export it. So that makes a difference. It makes a big difference that you wouldn't use the same file for both places type of thing. So I wanna show a couple of other things too that you've done for me, Nicole, when it comes to additional graphics that you need for your website, she's perfect with that. She helped me design things for like t-shirts, you know, anything that you wanna print on Vistaprint if you need help with bookmarks or even a template. We worked on a kit to send to the schools and she was able to take, you know, some really nice designs and lay it out so that I have a really professional looking letter to send to the schools for, to, for school visits. And then we also did the Amazon store, some layouts for things there. It's a Kickstarter. I think there is a really good case to be made that if you don't have the funds to print a book yet, print a hardcover, you can still launch with your paperback and then do a Kickstarter to raise the funds. So here, Nicole designed these banners, which was really kind of nice. As we go through, there's the author, the illustrator. Um, so we connected and she really helped me a lot with just making this, look at the rewards that she put together. It, I'm not very good when it comes to Canva or graphic design. So having a friend like Nicole, where I was able to just reach out and say, hey, can you help me with this? Even just advertising and things like that. I love how she used a lot of the characters that Len created in the features. A graphic designer does a lot more than just lay out a book, is I guess what I'm saying. Yeah. You need some something to punch up your website or to punch up marketing materials or a Kickstarter. It can go a long way in helping you look much more professional. This is a hard copy, but this is one of the covers I did for our friend Bridget. And she was going to a convention in New York, and it was pretty much like a week after her book was up on Amazon, so she really didn't have much to bring. So, you know, she bought a tablecloth, and I have, you know, I'm a crafty person, so I have machines to, to cut vinyl, and like April said, to make t-shirts. So I made her a tablecloth with her logo on the front of it in a color that matches her book. I gave her designs to do flyers and postcards and posters, and she ordered all that, and she said people were so impressed with how she pulled it all together so quickly. And, you know, it was really just a matter of taking that book cover design and utilizing those fonts, those colors, and then, you know, her story and her information to just, you know, make a nice display. So it's great to have a designer because I'm not very good with visualizing what things can potentially be. So having somebody like Nicole that just has that vision, like I wouldn't even know what to ask for. Sometimes she would just come to me and say, I got some ideas. Just let me in there. <laughs> and maybe that's because because we're super, we're very good friends. But Her minds are connected most yeah. of the time anyway. <laughs> she knows where my weaknesses are, and boy, I have plenty of them. So, but she's just a master at coming up with ideas and things and make things that I would never even request. I look at it and I say, "How did you do that?" It's just amazing. So anyway, she is phenomenal. Thank you, Nicole, for spending time with us. So let me just remind you that you should be reading through that section 15. Just do a refresh because that is titled in Bobby's book. It's titled, Why Do You Need a Graphic Designer? So a lot of the things we talked about today, you know, will be a refresher of that section 15. All right. Have a great day, everyone.